Good morning, everyone. And welcome to worship with Dracon Springside Parish Church. Whether you're here in the church or at home, it's great to worship together. Please stand for the Bible. Today we welcome back our Sunday School after your great prize giving last week. It's lovely to see you back again. We've missed you so much. So it's really lovely to have you with us. Uh, last week we had the congregational vote um, and I'm going to read you the results of that. Um, if you wish <coughs> to look at it after the service for a closer look, there are some copies here on the front seat. So the vote was as follows. Um, from Fullerton Church, the basis of union, 96 for and one against. And for Jamie Ehrlichan, 93 for and four against. In Muir Relief Church, the basis of union, 49 for, three against and one abstention. And for the Reverend Neil Urquhart, 99 for, uh, 39 for, sorry, 12 against and two abstentions. For the Reverend Jamie Ehrlichan, 47 for, four against and two abstentions. Dragon and Springside, the basis of union, 93-4, 14 against. For the Reverend Neil Urquhart, 94-4 and 13 against. And then on a recount of the papers, 88-4 and 20 against. For Girdle Toll, the basis of union, 25-4 and five against, one abstention. Reverend Jamie Mellican, 28-4, three against, Reverend Neil Urquhart, 21, four, and 10 against. And St Andrews, the basis of union, 17, four, and no one against. The Reverend Jane Mellican, 17, four, and no one against. And Reverend Neil Urquhart, 15, four, and two against. And as I said, if you wish to have a closer look at that, there are copies here on the, at the front. Following that, yesterday, the Presbytery held their meeting and um, at that, the union of the five Irving churches was approved. And it will take place, according to church law, on the 1st of October. Um, it will then be agreed by the Church of Scotland and by Oscar after that. But from the 1st of October, we will be unified. I um, also would like to draw your attention to a couple of intimations in the order of service. Next weekend, Fullerton Congregation are having their weekend at Gowan Bank near Darvel, and they will be delighted to see anyone who wishes to join them on Saturday for um, some time of learning and fellowship. If you wish to join them that day, please let me know. And it is with great sadness that we announce the death of Tom Dunn. And the funeral service will take place at 11.30 on Thursday the 14th of September at Holmesford Bridge Crematorium. And our thoughts and prayers are with Carrie and their family at this very sad time. And now we welcome back to our pulpit Reverend Andy Black, who is a favourite of ours. <laughs> and uh, we're really looking forward to hearing him speak today. Thank you, Andy. I must have been singing that tracks people to it. There's got to be, I can't think of anything else. And it may be great to be back this morning eh, to share with you in worship. The psalmist writes these words Praise the Lord, my soul. O Lord, my God, how great you are. We worship God and we sing to his praise from Mission Praise 560. Praise my soul, the King of heaven.
God shows his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, being justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us unite our hearts and pray. Let us all pray. Almighty and eternal God, our loving Heavenly Father, you are the giver of all life and breath and hope. So we come to worship and to glorify your holy name. The whole creation has come into being through your power. And we rejoice that your purpose for creation is a loving purpose. You have revealed your love for us in Jesus Christ. And we have been brought to a loving faith in him and are privileged indeed. So with us people throughout the world, we join our offering of worship to the offering of worship that rises constantly from earth to heaven. Lord Jesus, we want to witness to your love, to share with others what you have done for us, and to reflect something of your love through the people we are. We want to be a light to those around us, proclaiming your saving love through our words and actions. But we do not always know how or where or when. We mean to speak out, but when that moment comes, we are nervous and tongue-tied, uncertain as to what to say, afraid of doing more harm than good. We feel that our clumsy efforts might turn people away from you rather than help them consider your claims. Sometimes we lack faith, not sure whether anyone would want to listen and at times unable to believe our witness would make any real difference. And so we simply keep quiet. Lord, for our failures to make you known, forgive us. Lord Jesus, teach us that it is not in the cleverness of our words that has the power to change lives, but the message of your love and the wonder of your grace. Teach us that you can use our witness beyond our wildest expectations when it is offered from the heart, a spontaneous and genuine expression of all you mean to us. Teach us to trust in you, confident you will give us the words to say when we need them, and give us faith to leave the rest to you. Save us from making excuses or from evading your challenge, and so help us openly and honestly to speak for you, and so live to your glory. In your name we pray, and hear us now as we further pray in the words you taught us, saying together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. So how is everybody this morning? You certainly don't sound it, I'll tell you that. How are you guys? How many folk are back at school? Are you glad to be back at school? No. Nope. <laughs> one honest soul in the place. Or one honest soul. So, but it's not too bad, is it? Is it rubbish? What's rubbish about it? Too much work. What would you like to happen then? What would you like to be able to do at school when you got in the morning? So some work, but... So, right. My favourite time at school was playtime and dinner time. <laughs> PE. Oh, you like PE? That's good then. That's good. But do you like at school? Are you at school? You don't like well, right, Okay, we don't like school. I'm sorry I asked the question though. How many of the grown up like to go to school? Has anybody all liked it because you get paid for going? Right. So I'm sure, I'm sure school, you like school, not maybe all the time, but school's a good place to go to. Because when we go to school, 
we learn new things, don't we? We learn new things. And up this morning, I'm really thinking about how we learn new things. How many folk have ever been at a quiz? How many adults have sat exams? How many, how many adults passed their exams? Well, I'm glad to hear. I know I'm not going into Latin again. Forget that. <laughs> uh, so asking questions uh, uh, is really important. How many folk at, at quizzes? Television is full of all sorts of quizzes during the week. How many folk watch The Chase? Right, okay. Pointless? Right. How many folk watch Terrible? No? Right. There's a music one on in a Saturday. I can all remember it. It's like, uh, name that tune where they play a bit of music and the, the, the contestants have got to name the tune. But it's all modern stuff, which is absolute rubbish. I'd, I'd, I don't get it at all. Bring back the 60s, that's what I say. So asking questions is really, really important. And sometimes questions enable us to understand things better. Sometimes questions baffle us. How many folk do crosswords? I know why it's called crosswords. Because I use quite a few when I'm trying to. They give you really stupid clues and you've got to find the answer. And that sometimes uh, is quite difficult. So asking questions is really important. This morning, I'm going to talk about a man from the Old Testament, a man with the name of Job. And Job had a really hard time. So sometimes questions are good, it makes us understand things. And sometimes when we're going through difficult times, hard times, we ask all sorts of questions. And Job was going through a really, really hard time. He was having a really difficult time. And his pal said to him, Job, you're just a bad person. That's why these things are happening to you. It's why he said, why don't you just give up in God? Forget it. God's no interested in you. But she was wrong. Because Job was to learn through his questions. There were answers that God spoke to him and gave him. And sometimes the answers are really important to our questions. Because sometimes the answers baffle us. Sometimes we don't really understand the answers. But Job is told simply, trust in me. Trust in God. Regardless of what we're going through, trust in God. And the, the things will work out eventually. Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus promises us to be with us through every experience of our life. No matter what we're called to face, whether it's good times or bad times, difficult times. We have the promise that Jesus will walk that road with us. And while the answers might sometimes hurt us and sometimes baffle us, we have the assurance that Jesus is going to be with us all the time. And I would hope this morning that we will rejoice in the knowledge that as we go through life, as we walk through the road of life, Jesus promises to be with us and we can turn to him at any time and seek his help and strength to cope. And we're going to sing one more step along the world I go.
reading this morning, the first reading is taken from the Old Testament with Job, chapter 38, verses 1 to 7. And it can be found in the Old Testament section of the Pew Bible on page 531. Then out of the storm the Lord spoke to Job. Who are you to question my wisdom with your ignorant, empty words? Now stand up straight and answer the questions I ask you. Were you there when I made the world? If you know so much, tell me about it. Who decided how large it would be? Who stretched the measuring line over it? Do you know all the answers? What holds up the pillars that support the earth? Who laid the cornerstones of the world? In the dawn of that day, the stars sang together and the heavenly beings shouted for joy. The second reading this morning is taken from the New Testament, Luke chapter 20, verses 1 to 8. To be found in the New Testament section of the Pew Bible, page 106. One day when Jesus was in the temple, teaching the people and preaching the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law together with the elders came and said to him, Tell us, what right do you have to do these things? Who gave you such right? Jesus answered them, now let me ask you a question. Tell me, did John's right to baptize come from God or from human beings? They started to argue amongst themselves, what shall we say? If we say from God, he will say, why then did you not believe John? But if we say from human beings, this whole crown here will stone us because they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered, We don't know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you then by what right I do these things. Amen. Thank you, Frank. We continue in our praise. We sing through the love of God our Saviour. Let us pray. 
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. My text this morning can be found in the book of Job, chapter 38, at verse 2, where God answers Job. Who are you to question my wisdom with your ignorant, empty words? I have always been intrigued by those religious signs that you sometimes see on the back of buses as well as outside some churches. And I really like the signs outside of Fullerton Church which carry a positive faith message depicting something of the message of the gospel. And I think they make people stop and think about important spiritual things. Some posters can be reinterpreted, like the one that proudly said in bold capitals, Jesus is the answer, under which some wag wrote, remind me, what is the question? Maybe the person who wrote this remark is absolutely right. We need to remind ourselves of the important questions that faith seeks to give answers to. Questions such as, what is the meaning of life? Why am I here? Does anything make sense? Is someone running the show, or are we at the mercy of blind fate? These are questions that biblical faith seeks to answer. Yet we should be careful not to offer glib answers to important questions that arise especially in times of personal crisis. In times of deep distress, when we are being tossed about by life's experiences, we need to hear more than the simple statement, God is the answer, regardless of how true that might be. When we look at Job, we find that when he is faced by an onslaught of personal problems and crisis, he seeks answers from God. Job feels sorry for himself. And I'm sure that we can understand why this is the case. He has lost his property, his family, and we are told that he finds himself afflicted with loathsome sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. And his wife holds him in complete contempt. She says to him, Do you hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Job also listens to his three friends' feeble attempts to make sense of his pain and his loss. But nothing they said could ease his suffering. All Job wanted was a chance to plead his case before God. Job was certain that if God would only hear him, God would bring justice and restore his fortunes. Job had faith that God would make sense of his situation and put everything back in order. And now finally comes the long awaited moment. At last, God speaks to Job. But God does not give the answer that Job expected. Job was waiting for God to vindicate him and show him what his suffering meant. Instead, God reminds Job just who it is he is speaking with and asks Job what his qualifications are for questioning the wisdom and the justice of God. God takes Job on a verbal tour of the grandeur of nature. God asks him, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Do you know the ordinance of the heavens? Can you establish their rule upon the earth? Declare to me if you have knowledge. And so it goes on, with Job's pleadings thrown in his face and God asking the questions and maybe that is how it should be God asking the questions 
while we live and give out the answers. When we read the Bible, we soon realize that it leans towards God's initiative and our response. We hear God ask in Genesis, Adam, where are you? Then we hear God's words of challenge to Moses amid his people suffering in Egypt. Will you lead my people? Or again, Isaiah, as he faced the majesty of God, understands his calling to be a prophet in this question asked by God, who will go? Whom shall I send? And then to Job he says, brace yourself, stand with courage, and I will question you. We should learn from Job's experience. Earlier in the story, Job had been talking as if he knew exactly how God should run the world. His sense of integrity had been the basis of his presumptuous claim that God should somehow have treated him much, much better. He was outraged that he could not square the belief of his innocence with all the terrible things that had happened to him. So Job dared to challenge and judge his creator. Job, for whatever reason, forgot that as a creature, he should acknowledge and glorify the creator at all times. Now asking God questions is not wrong. However, the way we ask them might well be. Simply put, if we ask the wrong questions, we will get the wrong answers. The Pharisees often confronted Jesus and asked the wrong questions. We read earlier of how they asked questions regarding his authority in order to undermine him. And Jesus responds by asking them a question regarding John's right to baptize, a question they could never answer. They were to realize that their efforts to demand answers from Jesus was futile. And Job learned the same lesson regarding making demands on God. We cannot come before God and make demands. We need to remind ourselves of just who we are, a fallen, sinful humanity. And we need to remind ourselves who it is that we are questioning. It is the Creator God, the one who alone is holy and righteous. We cannot come before him and demand our rights simply because before him we don't have any rights. We can only come before him because of his mercy, his grace and his love. You see, we should always be mindful of just who we are dealing with when we ask God questions. Yes, it can be challenging to ask God questions because if we look for answers, we in turn get questions from him. Or maybe we should see this challenge in a very positive way because when God asks us his questions of challenge, it may lead us into new, exciting adventures like Moses and Isaiah. While being asked questions by God may open up ways for new service, most of us, including myself, feel just a tad uncomfortable with the thought of having to answer God in this way. I think most of us would prefer a religion that poses fewer problems and prescribes more cures. A religion that solves the riddles of life without impinging on our comfortable lifestyle. Like that poster which stated, Jesus is the answer. We are much more comfortable with the idea of us having a God that concentrates in giving the answers and not asking questions. The Christian faith believes that God, through Jesus Christ, has revealed himself in such a way that we can discover the truth about his nature and his purpose for humankind, as well as his purpose for the world. While in the person of Jesus, we can glimpse truths that are eternal and which upon our salvation totally depends. For example, 
when Jesus claims to be the way, the truth, and the life, there is no other way to the Father except through me. He is making it clear that only through a relationship with him can we begin to know God in a personal and intimate way. And as such, Jesus gives us the answers to the question posed by the rich young ruler, along with many through the ages who ask, how can I receive eternal life? Who are you to question my wisdom with your ignorant, empty words? When we stand in awe of the majesty of God, it seems all the more remarkable that God should put aside his glory to come among us in the person of Jesus. And God came among us as one of us, not so we can control him, but that we might be drawn closer to him. That we might be drawn into that realm that is far greater than anything we can ever conceive of. Into the very presence of Almighty God. Into that glory which is beyond human understanding to which the grandeur of creation points towards. Jesus once said, whoever wants to find their life must first lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Knowing that God is Lord, even in the wilderness, the trackless deserts, the fathomless seas, and the raging storm, means that we can be certain that this same God is also the Lord of the wildest places in our hearts. God did not give Job an answer to his suffering. But God does give our suffering a place, a context, and an assurance that even though we do not understand why, our pain and our sorrow are not and never will be the last word. God holds us through every experience and nothing can wrench us away from his hand. May we, like Job, come to understand that trusting in God through every experience in the end brings us blessing. Let us pray. Lord, you have given us the amazing privilege to come into your presence through the gift of prayer. Help us never to take your presence for granted. Instead, help us to remember that you are God, the creator and ruler of all, while we are only part of your creation. As we seek to live in fellowship with you, may we experience your peace and power, that we might praise and serve you as we should. And these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Again, to God's praise from Mission Praise 115. Do not be afraid.
Now we bring before God our prayers of thanksgiving, our prayers and concern for others, our prayers of inter intercession and our offering prayer. Let us all pray. Living God, we thank you for your promise that when we come together in the name of Jesus, he is here among us. We thank you that he is here now, ready to speak, listen, forgive, teach and love. He is present here in one another in the fellowship we share together. He is present through the scriptures, constantly speaking to us in new ways. He is present in the world around us, in the beauty of creation and in the people we meet. He is present every moment of every day through his life-giving and life-transforming spirit. Living God, we thank you that whoever we are, wherever we are, you are with us through Christ, constantly by our side, traveling with us, and looking to lead us forward into new experiences of your love. Lord, we thank you that we have received so much from you. And in love, we bring before you our prayers for those who stand in need. Loving God, there are times when we look at people's lives and find it hard to believe that things can ever change for the better. We see people racked by illness, weighed down by anxiety, tormented by depression, broken by addiction to alcohol and drugs, scarred by bereavement, shattered through unemployment, and we wonder what their prospects really are. What hope can we realistically offer to them? What help can we possibly give? Transforming God, may your light shine where there is darkness. We pray for such people known to us, family, friends, members of our church fellowship, neighbours, as well as countless people unknown to us, struggling under their own particular burdens, those we mention now in the silence of our hearts. Transforming God, may your light shine where there is darkness. We pray for our world, for those many people who face suffering, injustice, hardship, and even death. Reach out to all who are in despair, all who long for change, but see only hopelessness stretching before them. Touch their lives and bring help, hope, healing, and wholeness. Loving God, it is hard sometimes to believe those around us, still less the world can ever change for the better. We see countries broken by war, people consumed by hatred, many living in fear, people facing famine, multitudes made homeless by disaster. And we especially remember people in Hawaii and Florida who have suffered natural disasters. Lord, help us to see beneath the surface, recognizing you're at work and that things can change. Help us to see beyond appearances, recognizing you're a God able to transform even the most hopeless of situations. Give to us and to all people the assurance that there is no one and no situation unable to be transformed by your power. Lord God, all that we are and all that we have is your gift to us. Our gifts and prayers and the whole of our lives we offer with gratitude and joy to your service. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We close our worship. We turn to 760 in mission praise when we walk with the Lord, trust and obey.
Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with each one of you and all whom you love this day and forevermore.